like this broad crazy and tripping. But as she starts having a like a PTSD meltdown crying on the phone, she described it to the T. There's this thing standing on their balcony with its wings spread looking at him through the window. That is scary to me. Leave it alone, leave it alone, leave it alone. Don't talk about it. And you know, in Native American culture, you ain't even supposed to talk about it. One guy definitely went there thinking he was going to find a dog, man, but he ended up encountering a seven foot tall, emaciated, pale person running like an animal, basically. Judge it based on the amount of evidence that you can find. Not just like drawings and depictions, but actual video evidence. Who has a ring doorbell on the back door of their house? You know what I'm saying? Like, nobody does that. That's how scared these people are. Like, it's terrifying. Terrifying. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dark Waters, also known as the King of Horror, and you are now listening to the Wild Initiative Podcast. (laughs) Hello, and welcome to a very special Halloween episode of the Wild Initiative, brought to you, as always, as part of the Waypoint Outdoor Collective. Getting on to today's episode... Ladies and gentlemen, it's that time of year, spooky season, where our minds are more attuned, more aware of the paranormal. You may remember my guest from last year's episode, but ladies and gentlemen, I've brought him back. The one and only king of YouTube horror, Dark Waters. And we sit and review many stories of things that creep and crawl and go bump in the night. Enjoy this Halloween episode with the one and only Dark Waters. Dark Waters, thank you so much for hopping on with me today, man. Oh, man, I'm happy to be back with you and your audience. And I'm excited about this conversation. I love talking with you. It's always fun and entertaining. And uh, hopefully we can get to some spooky, scary stuff. Or maybe we can break something new. I don't know what we're going to do, but let's let's have fun. doing it. <laughs> there we go. So one thing I would uh, love for you to do for those who haven't listened to the prior episode, I will recommend to everyone to go listen to that episode. Uh, I'm I'll be honest, I want to say it was episode 171 uh, back in October of 2020. So I will encourage everyone to go listen to that episode. But for those that haven't, where uh, give maybe a little bit about your history and how you got uh, got involved and kind of pulled into the world of the paranormal. Sure, that's no big deal. So my name is James Williams. I um, I'm born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, which. I don't know if anybody's ever visited here that's listening. If you have visited New Orleans, you understand that it is the paranormal central of the South. Um, uh, As far as, you know, the persona dark waters and how I've gotten to that business, um, the business of like horror and talking about horror and sharing stories. uh, Storytelling is something that's always been natural to me. It's something that you develop being a person here in New Orleans because the way we communicate with each other. Um, in the way we entertain each other. It's a, really a family-based uh, city where you'll have large family groups together and large groups of friends together all the time. And so storytelling is something that comes natural. Um, when it comes to paranormal encounters, I've had my fair share of paranormal encounters, uh, especially with my family having like a background history in hoodoo and voodoo and that's in my bloodline. And then just growing up here, you know, being a kid, in New Orleans that played in the swamps and things running us out of the swamps, uh, things running us up trees, seeing things in the woods. Um, And then as I started to really kind of move through um, the process of, you know, sharing true paranormal encounters for the record, every paranormal encounter that I share, I don't care if it's Bigfoot, dog, man, demons, flying humanoids, they've been vetted by me through my vetting process. There's extensive, Um, work out there on my YouTube channel that explains my vetting process. Um, When I started getting into that, where I started vetting people and talking to strangers and um, just random people who wanted to share the story with me is when we really, really saw an uptick in the paranormal activity, mainly because, you know, people had attachments to them, demonic attachments. Um, Other people practice, you know, Wicca, which is not bad, but then you have a couple of Satanists, like 
all kinds of stuff happen. And so all I do now is I share those encounters with the world. And I spend a lot of time vetting encounters. Um, you know, the average encounter that's on my YouTube channel or my website, I spend about two hours talking to the person for an average five to six minute story. That's about two hours of conversation. When you get to something that's 15, 20, 30, an hour, I mean, that's weeks of vetting, weeks of conversations. And me trying to trip that individual up and force them to lie or see if they're lying. And the ones who get through the process, their stories turn out to be marvelous and magnificent. The other ones, they fall to the wayside along the way, you know? Yes, absolutely. And and one of the things, you know, that we I think we talked about in the, the first episode is, you know, you're going to get a lot of people saying like, oh, you know, you're just you're just some crazy person. You're coming in. You're you're not just some crackpot. You're an educated man. You if you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Background in electrical engineering. I mean, a degree in a uh, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering with a minor in physics. Work for the Department of Defense in space and strategic defense command. No, no, no. My credentials are strong as far as, um, you know, I'm not a guy who was desperate for money who said, oh, I'm just going to jump on the Internet and just talk about tell scary stories. You know what I'm saying? Um, even though there is monetization, to everything I do, um, my background history is strong, very, very strong. And so that's how I was able to develop my criteria for vetting stories. You know, the way I do it is very, very unique. And it has a lot of complicated tactics and techniques used. The same stuff that the police use when they're trying to catch you in a lie. If you've ever been arrested and you were sitting in that room in handcuffs and sitting on the other side of the table and they're asking you what happened and they're looping you and adding stuff into your story, it's literally the same tactics and that they use, that I use on the witnesses. The only difference is they have the advantage of looking you in your eyes so they can pick up on the tells of you lying a lot faster. That's why it takes me so much longer is because I'm not looking you in your eye. I'm just sitting there listening, intentively listening to everything that you're saying over and over. And I have to make the person repeat it like two, three, four times to try and catch what they're saying. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we talked a lot last episode, you know, we went through a lot of a lot of the tales, a lot of the stories. And I mean, we we actually, if I remember correctly, we went into depth on, I mean, things like even with the the Bigfoots, things like family structure and, and diet and communications and a lot of this stuff. Uh, we went through, I mean, we talked about the dog man, Bigfoot, fire demons, the red man, the vomit creature. Try, I mean, we went through yeah, the we went list, ham. man. Oh yeah. That was, a, I was, I was like sitting there. I, I was had a couple of times where I was just listening to the stories and I kind of forgot I was running the podcast. Um, <laughs> I was, I'm like, I'm like, why, why isn't the host asking a new question? Uh, I'm like, Oh, that's me. Um, so, uh, you know, I've kind of got this list here of, of some, some other of maybe the, the common creatures or, you know, um, kind of American monsters or, or whatnot, if you will, that, that people may have heard of or be familiar with. And I would love to just kind of to kick things off to run through this list with you and, and get your insight on the stories you've heard, you know, your belief, uh, whether or not you believe they're real, or maybe if, if they're based off of a different creature, whatever, whatever that may be. So let's, let's see what we got on this list here. Yeah, let's go for it. So Number one, everyone, uh, I, th I think it's kind of become a term for uh, the the monster catch all. But uh, the chupacabra, what do, what do we got about the chupacabra? Um, I've had stories um, told to me about the chupacabra, um, a number of them. All those stories come from south of the border. Uh, and a lot of them come from uh down on the Gulf of Texas uh, would be the southwestern Gulf, all the way down at the tip. I believe definitely that not only is there a chupacabra, but there's the blue dogs that are there, which some people mistake for chupacabras, which are just these dogs with blue skin that have gigantic, huge teeth that will literally eat you alive. And we're not talking about a dog man. I mean, we're not talking about a dog man. We're not talking about a chupacabra. Sometimes the chupacabra is mistaken. Uh, for the blue dog. So absolutely, the chupacabra exists. Um, the concept of 
the photos that people have seen, you know, on online where you have kind of that skinless animal. You know, everybody's seen those photos where they killed a quote unquote chupacabra. I can't verify the validity of that. What my witnesses have described to me has been a little bit different. Um, it falls about 70 percent in line with those photos. But, you know, I can't verify the photos, so I can't say that that's an accurate depiction of it. Um, I think as far as human beings being at risk from anything with a chupacabra, it's not a risk to us. I mean, it's not like it's something that a shotgun won't kill as long as you're not afraid and you realize that it's there. Um, so if I had to, like, grade the danger and the threat of that creature, that would be on the lower end of the scale. And if the high end is 10, then that would be like a three. You know what I'm saying? Like, OK, I'm out in, in, in Mexico and I see a chupacabra running down on me. I'm plugging them and keeping it moving. And that's all it is to it. But they're definitely real. There's too many accounts of it. I've had too many accounts of it um, where they're real witnesses. Um, two of them in particular were border control, border patrol agents. One of them just recently um, quit, but the other one is still there. So I'm, I can definitely vouch for that there is a chupacabra. And I'm, I'm actually, I really like this idea of, I think so for, hey, as we, as we go through these discussions, I, I would love to get your like, uh, I don't want to call it necessarily a danger rating, but maybe that's the, the best. That's what term. it is. It's a danger rating. Yeah. So let's, uh, as we go through this list, I'd love to, I'd love to, uh, to get your uh, like official dark waters danger rating for, for each of these creatures. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. We can go back. What's the next one. All right. So we, we got, uh, the Jersey devil or uh, also known as the Leeds devil. I've had one story shared with me about the Jersey devil. Um, and that guy turned out to be just lying. I mean, lying through his two front teeth. He had actually went online on Reddit, found a story about the Jersey devil and um, and then decided to call me and tell me about it. And so it just sounded too put together. Like, you know, somebody had just put the, the story was just too perfect. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. he, he didn't have any reactions. Like there was no real fear in his voice. And the, basically it was that this creature came flying down at him over the trees when he was out hunting. And I'm like, OK, so you're out hunting, you're walking through the woods. And he said it was at night. And I'm like, OK, so you're walking through the woods at night and then you hear these wings flapping. And then this creature comes down over the trees at you. And what do you do? And I just didn't hear any terror in his voice. Like if I and I put myself in that situation. And I'm like, I would be scared out of my mind, but I didn't hear and detect any terror in his voice. So the story that I have is fraudulent to address the creature itself. I believe it has to be real because there are so many accounts that go so far back throughout time that, that something has to be true about it. I can't personally vouch for it from what anybody's told me mm -hmm. personally to where I can say, yeah, I'm 100 percent confident based on what this person has shared with me or this witness has shared. But I think that when you find something that spans the time range um, in which the, the encounters have for that creature, you have to um, you have to, you know, peg it as being true and being real and not necessarily based on um, something else, just as is on his face, prima facie real. I think that's how you're going to have to take that as far as danger is concerned and hurting and taking people and threatening people. Everything I've ever heard about it, it hasn't been anybody who taken or killed by it. And I could be mistaken, um, but I don't think it again. I don't think that's a very, very dangerous thing. I will put that at a four as far as a danger rating. Now, could you give uh, maybe a quick description of, of what what the Jersey or the Leeds devil is? I can give a description of what. I've seen photos of, which is what everybody else is seeing, which is a horse, a uh, creature with wings that got a head of a horse and hooves like a, um, and hooves on it that flies around in the air um, and swoops down on people. And as you know, the legend of it is, you know, a woman had a child and that child was born defective. And that's what ended up being the Jersey devil. Um, now, here's something I will say. I believe that in some cases, the Mothman itself has been mistaken for the Jersey devil for sure. Because in that area, I have had people talk to me about Mothman and they were calling it the Jersey devil. But when we started really getting into what they saw, I was like, nah, bro, that's more sound like a Mothman to me than it sounds like a Jersey devil, like glowing red eyes, 
huge, gigantic wings. It wasn't like this horse headed creature. It was more humanoid in the face. And I was like, eh, that sounds like Mothman to me. And then the speed in which it moved and how it hovered in the air and darted around. I was like, dude, I think you're talking about, I think you saw Mothman. So um, those are kind of the diametrically opposed witness descriptions. If you go back over any TV show or radio show or anything like that, that really talks about the real Jersey devil, they describe it as having a freaky horse like head. And you, as you know, the Mothman really looks like more humanoid ish type creature. Mm hmm. Well, so speaking of the Mothman, that was actually the next one on my list. I am going with a sixth level of danger for the Mothman because I've had a hell of a lot of accounts from Chicago um, about Mothman, like some creepy, scary stuff like broads who like in their condos downtown Chicago, you know, and you're in your condo on a 10th floor taking a shower and you know you know women are they like to come out the shower buck naked walk around you ain't nobody supposed to be able to see you and then there's this thing standing on their balcony with its wings spread looking at them through the window that is scary to me why mm -hmm. it doesn't it didn't come in why it didn't slide the slab the glass door open or break it and get her i don't know but that's frightening and just the potential for that danger and the ability to hover and fly and move very quickly and just um, be in places in which you would not anticipate there being danger. I think that's that, that's just insane. Like, I, I don't even want to go to Chicago because I don't want the chances of running into anything like that. And as you know, in that area, there are hundreds of reports of it. Uh, Lon Strickler from Phantoms and Monsters blog did a whole year long thing where he had witness after witness after witness after witness, real credible witnesses. And Lon is very, very credible in my book that talked about their Mothman experiences in Chicago. So yeah, I, Mothman is definitely real. Um, and then there are these other humanoid flying individuals that I would put in the bucket with Mothman. I can't say that they're off Mothman. Like there was one, uh, I can't remember exactly where it was. This, this couple were on their honeymoon. Instead of going like to Vegas or going, you know, to the wine country for their honeymoon, they like to go camping. They like to go out into the woods. So they went out into the woods and rented a cabin and spent their time like fishing and hiking. And uh, one evening they're on their way back to their cabin. They had been on a long hike and they're just walking along, the talking and the guy's wife kind of stops and he keeps walking. And um, he, he thought she was kind of like messing with him and joking. He's like, babe, come on, you know, quit playing. We need to go. She's like, well, who's that up there in the sky? So he looks up in the air and he literally sees a man, but he's like, his body's grayed out. Like imagine mm -hmm. just no wings, just a humanoid feet creature with like a gray body, just hovering in the air above the trees, 30, 40 feet above the trees. And they both are standing there staring at this thing, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Finally, he's like, OK, this is really weird. Runs back to his wife to get her, grabs her by the hand because she seems like she's mesmerized and literally drags her. And they run all the way back to the cabin. Turns out that while she. And I probably, I'm pretty sure I can say this while she's standing there looking at this thing, she was feeling not only sexually aroused, but she was feeling as if something was touching her body while she was standing there. He told hmm. her. He didn't want it to ruin their honeymoon. She told him, hell no, it's already ruined our honeymoon and we're leaving. And so they packed up and left. That's and there's more than Mothman out there when it comes to floating and flying humanoid creatures. Now, that dude, whatever the hell that is, he up there because that I spoke to her and that woman had a breakdown because she said, I felt like my body was being violated by hands that I didn't see. And I was like, well, how far away was he? And she was like, he was in the air 40 yards away above a tree. But I literally felt him touching my areolas and touching my thighs. And I'm like, when she's telling me this, I'm like, this bro crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you're tripping. But as she starts having a like a PTSD meltdown, crying on the phone because I'm forcing her to relive it, like describe the feeling like I, and I didn't felt bad about it. But I was like, describe the feeling. And she described it to the T like in. in I'm not going because I don't want to be like, yeah, I don't yeah. want to be like pornography or verbal porn. But like literally, she described the feelings to the T. 
the tingling sensations, how it ran up her arms. And, and I was like, oh, crap. So not only do we have Mothman out there, we got some other dude that's wild. And get this, this is the crazy thing. Imagine he's there hovering in the air above them and then just darts off. Now, there's no noise, no vibration, no nothing, no like no humming. Mm-hmm. And he just darts off. And both of them like, what the hell is going on? I mean, crazy, man. So, yeah, when you start dealing with flying humanoid creatures, yeah, you're up there in the, on a the danger scale to me. Because if you can fly, you can be anywhere at any point in time. Next thing mm-hmm. you know, you know, me and you on a Southwest flight. And we headed to Chicago or we headed to New York and homeboys looking at us through the window while we on the plane. You know what I'm yep. saying? Could you imagine the terror that you would have? That's insane. Well, and the humanoid aspect of it kind of gives you an expectation that they're going to be a little more intelligent, uh, uh, maybe, you know, not not necessarily and not always the case, but not necessarily just living off of instinct, but more they have their own intentions and methods and and. And that intelligence uh, probably adds to that danger. Well, not only that, but the humanoid, the humanoid nature um, combined with the intelligence. What worries me is the psychological profile of something like that. Like when you have the ability to do what everybody else can't do. I mean, like the moral fabric of that being would need to be called into question. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know where it, that came from or what it is. I can't tell you, but I do know that power corrupts all things. You know what I'm saying? So, and that is some power to have. So unless you are in some kind of advanced alien species with a great moral compass, dude, ain't no telling what the hell that thing been rolling around the planet mm-hmm. of earth doing to people. You know what I'm saying? People talk oh, yeah. about missing 411 and national Park parks and forests. And they're like, Oh, Bigfoot did it. Oh, you know, dog man did it. No, they got a dude flying around through the air that's <laughs> telepathically raping broads. So you might want to take a look at him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You might want to take a look at that. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe reconsider uh, uh, blaming the some of the more peaceful creatures like the Bigfoot. Yeah. Bigfoot got getting a bad reputation. The homeboy flying around molesting broads like he uh, Harvey Weinstein with wings. You know what I'm saying? Come on. Be big for the loan. That's 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 gotta be one of the best quotes that's ever been said on this podcast to date. It's like Harvey Weinstein with wings. Oh uh, god, help me. Um <laughs> I might cry in right now. I'm laughing so hard at that. Yeah, but my man Bigfoot um, get blamed for everything, though. Yep. That's just wrong. <laughs> um so uh we got we got another creature here, the Wendigo. Yeah, that's uh that's a bad memory jamming right there, and that's definitely real. Um so I I've always had... kind of assumed that the Wendigo just came from either Dog Man or Bigfoot, one or the other. But it would you say it's its own creature? No, that that's its own creature. That's pure uh that's pure evil um and pure Native American lore based on real reality not myth i mean really based on real reality so um i'm not going to talk about i definitely not going to talk about what i've been what's been disclosed to me as to how they are created and how it's made because i don't want no smoke with the wendigo i don't want no smoke with that at all but what i will tell you is this there was a young lady who's highly highly psychic like an intuitive i'm like this girl is off the chain and um one of my associates who i helped on youtube her family reached out to him and we ended up on a through a conversation because initially we thought that this young lady was picking up on, um, on dog man. And it turned out, you know, through her being like an intuitive psychic child who didn't know how to control her powers. And she's about 15 right now. She had picked up on dog man. So essentially when they were in the area around, um, a hundred mile radius of her, she would get very, very angry and she would feel like she hated people and all the rest of this. So it was like, all right, cool. Um, we had other witness encounters of dog man around the same time. She started describing what she was seeing in her mind. And so cool. She told me things about me that nobody could know in period. Cause I never disclosed it publicly. And I'm like, okay, so you definitely got a gift. Well, during that time period, she was having problems around, um, around her town with other kids, like just picking on and messing with her because she's like, 
a, a kid who's pretty much psychic like that is weird to other kids. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and so they were picking on her. Well, some of the kids who picked on her started having experiences with a Wendigo. And the way that it was described was it literally was a gigantic being with a like its head looked like a deer skull, but like a huge, gigantic freaking deer skull. Like, if, I don't know how many points the biggest deer's head would be. I think it's like six point, eight point. But no, we're talking about huge and gigantic and it would be outside of their window um, just trying to intimidate them and scare them. And they described it to the T as in having like hooves, giant shoulders. The smell was coming through the window. It literally smelled like death was at their window uh, to the point to where the children left that little girl alone and they haven't bothered her since. And um, we've got her in contact with people who can help her kind of deal with her abilities because what we discovered was somehow, some way through her bloodline, that was attached directly to her as protection. And it completely freaked me out. I mean, like I, that's why I don't really want to talk about it because I don't want that thing mm -hmm. thinking I'm posing a threat to this little bro. For the record, I'm not. I love her. She's a cute little kid, but like I don't want no smoke with that, bro. Like no smoke whatsoever. Um, talk about missing 411 again. You can throw homeboy in the mix and he's up there. I'm putting him at a nine, baby. Like, leave that thing alone. Ooh. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Don't talk about it. And you know, in Native American culture, you ain't even supposed to talk about it. Period. You're not, you ain't, you ain't supposed to hold no conversation about that. That and skinwalkers, you are not supposed to hold conversations on because you invite them and you call upon them. So we're going to stop talking about that. And we're going to put that at a nine and we're going to keep it moving. All right. All right. So moving on, we got La Llorona. That is the um, the witch. If I'm not mistaken, that's like a, a witch like figure from um, Latin America. I haven't had many stories about that. I've had like witch stories, but it never was. Um, it never was by name called that. So. In my opinion, it has to be real. Again, um, it started somewhere. But in my opinion, also, these this is one of those things that is kind of cultural legends that are based in truth that got to the point to where it found an, a certain amount of popularity. And so it was monetized and you saw it come flying out of nowhere. Like it started off on YouTube where people were doing kind of creepy passes on it. You had a couple of witnesses come forward and. Then boom, next thing you know, there's movies on, you know, Amazon and Netflix about it. So is it based in reality? Absolutely. The majority of the stuff that we talk about in the paranormal realm, in the realm of woo and weird things is based. They are based in reality. The issue really boils down to um, how real the encounters are and how frequent they are. For me personally, there's a language barrier which prevents me from actually going and holding the conversations that need to be had with those witnesses. So I'm going to have to give it as being real. I'm going to have to give it a less than a five or I'm going to have to give it like a four. And it's not because it's not a threat. It's not because um, it's not real or anything like that. It's just that I don't have I have the language barrier where I can't really discuss things with those witnesses the way I want to to, to talk to them and get more information on it. But I definitely wouldn't. If somebody told me, hey, if you go in that set of woods or go into that village that this Lolorana is there, I wouldn't go. You know what I'm saying? I, I have enough respect for it to say, nah, y'all can keep that. I'll pass. You know what I'm saying? Let's, let's go fishing. Let's smoke some cigars. You know what I'm <laughs> saying? Say, let's go to the bar, have a margarita yeah. and smoke some cigars. I'm, yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm good, homie. <laughs> I don't need to look for it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's how you get messed up. Oh, I don't believe that exists. Let's go find it. All right, y'all. Good luck. You know what I'm saying? Good luck. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next one on the list is the Florida skunk ape. Let me inject, interject right here real quick before we go on the skunk ape. But okay. the skunk ape is just Bigfoot. That's all it is. You know what was freaky? Did you hear about the case down in Mexico where the whole town was besieged by a werewolf? I have not. I've not heard about that one. Yeah, there's a whole town. Uh, and I'm going to have to try and look it up. There's literally a whole town. It's documented. But a whole freaking town was besieged by a freaking werewolf. They, they call it a werewolf. I mean, it was all in the news down there. They got photos. There were priests involved. And the reason why I'm mentioning is that when we start talking about 
um, Latin America and we get down outside, and I'm not going to say it's not civilized society, but um, that's the wrong word to use. And then forgive me if I'm saying it that way. And I don't, I don't mean it that way. What I mean is um, we're talking about people who are still in touch with the old world and the old ways. We lost touch. We lost touch with that here in America a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Like they are experiencing things now, currently, right now, that we aren't. And it's some terrifying stuff. And in that encounter, it was jumping from roof to roof. There are they show the claw marks. They show everything. I'll I'll when this video's over, or when the show's over, I'll find it and tell you the exact location. But yeah, that's crazy. And so when we start talking about some of these myths and legends, like you really need to look south of the border to find a lot of this stuff. And that just goes into, it adds credibility to the concept of that witch that we were talking about before, because you're having sightings now. I mean, well-documented sightings. Like the priest talked about it. There was a freaking major news blogger that did a story on it down there because it was a real encounter and it creeped the hell out of people. Okay. Now to get back to the skunk ape, skunk ape is nothing more than Bigfoot. That's their name for Bigfoot. Um, and as we know, there's more than adequate evidence that skunk apes and Bigfoot are real. I mean, period. And there's no doubt about it. There's no way of getting around it. It's documented throughout history. It's documented by presidents. It's documented like across the board. It's documented that these creatures exist. And then we start talking about the danger level of those creatures. Then it's on a case by case basis because it depends on that creatures experience with human beings there's been bigfoot encounters and swamp ape encounters well let's just call it swamp ape and let's focus on florida particularly there's been encounters that i've had um people share with me out of florida where they've encountered this creature and it wasn't you know particularly aggressive at all it was just trying to go on about his business they interrupted the hunting and it got pissed off it's like yo i'm trying to get a meal and you standing in my kitchen get out you know Mm -hmm. what i'm saying like going about your business. But then there have been other encounters where people have uh, had close contact with these creatures that were very, very aggressive, you know, literally like beating on the foundations of their houses. But on the other end, they went out into the woods and had an encounter and shot at it. And so it came in and it checked them and did what it needed to do. So I would put that at a level 10 danger level because it has the ability to, to wreak havoc and destroy you and destroy things around you. But at the same time, it's based on your interaction with it. It's not like mm-hmm. they just come in and say, okay, I'm just going to roll up on your house, homie, and start doing something. They got a life to live. You know what I'm saying? Let them live their life. You know, they run around trying to catch with the little Bigfoot women's and do what they need to do. <laughs> so, but, so, so would a good comparison then be kind of like, so with bears, we have, we have brown bears, we have grizzly bears. And really the, the main difference between brown and grizzly bears is their location and the diet they eat. Would you say that would be like an apropos comparison for like the Bigfoot versus the skunk ape? Yeah, that would definitely be a great comparison. Um, because when you start talking about Bigfoots and the further north you go, um, when you start getting into like the serious Arctic wilderness and the Northwest and getting into like that area, they can be extremely aggressive. And I believe that that aggressiveness is due to at some points in times, the lack of food sources that are there. You know, it's like me and you, we haven't eaten in four days. I guess we grumpy and angry, you know what I'm saying? But when you're down here in the South where there's an abundance of food, an abundance of fish, alligators which they've been known to snatch up break their necks and eat them i mean the there's a difference based on the um the territory that they're in so i agree with you and there's different sizes based on where they are as well just like um, that skunk ape is definitely smaller than some of your northwestern bigfoots way smaller i mean Mm -hmm. i've had reports of bigfoots that are up there that are 13 14 feet tall and we're talking about huge gigantic animals you come down here and you got them, they eight, nine feet tall, pretty thick and big, but they're nowhere near as huge as those other animals. So some people call them people, but uh, I'm going to call them an animal because I ain't heard them talk to me and I ain't heard them mm-hmm. talk to nobody else. So, um, yeah, I think those that's the difference. Well, so and so just on this topic again, it would would something like a Yeti also be considered in Yep. In that family. So almost 
So actually, yeah, here's the question. So maybe would it almost be like the Florida skunk ape is like a black bear, the Bigfoot's like a brown bear, and then the Yeti's like a polar bear? Would that that's be what, like that's how place? if you want to yeah, if you want to break it down, that's how I believe you can break it down like that accurately. Absolutely. OK. And then you notice even the, the differences in aggression and the hunting ability just across the bears. For example, a polar bear is like the greatest predator you can ever run into. You know what I'm saying? Like literally polar bear is I always find it amazing how, you know, they'll show like a polar bear on a broken piece of ice and be like, oh, the polar bear is dying. The ice caps are melting. And I'm like, yo, do you know anything about polar bear? <laughs> like you do realize they swim. You do realize they can smell a drop of blood in the water from a mile away. Go up there and try and save that polar bear. and You're going to die. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, are you crazy? So, and I mean, we're talking about an extremely aggressive animal that will track you for miles and eat you. And I mean, I, that's the same thing when it comes to those yetis, which is what they're called in those Arctic environments and those hot, those cold weather environments. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you, you, you're spot on with that. So now there's a couple on this list that that I, I had kind of had suggested to me and found uh, that I'm not like I've never even heard of. And so this is one of them is the donkey lady. I ain't never heard of that. That one, it's uh, from the list, from what I understand, it was a it was it's almost similar to some of the the witch, the kind of the witch stories or uh, that where it was a, a lady who, you know, her children died. She was horribly burned in a fire and she was driven insane and began to to uh, to terrorize people and, and, and lived on. But that was that was one I wasn't familiar, familiar of at all. Mm-mm. I never heard of donkey lady. And then we start talking about women's and donkeys. Normally you're talking about a woman having a big butt. She got a donkey on a donkey. <laughs> That's it. We're not talking about, uh, I've never heard of that. Um, ever. I, I honestly, I've never heard of that. So I, I can't even comment on that at all. Cause I've never heard of it. So then the next one, uh, the next one is another one. I, uh, I haven't ever heard of before, but uh, the wampus cat. Is that like the female, like cat woman? Yeah, that's that's how I understand it. Uh, some people say it lives in in the down in the sewers. You know, I remember when that kind of took off. That was 2016, late 2016, maybe December 2016, but people started talking about the wampus cat, and it never really caught on at all when it came to like witness encounters. It was maybe like one or two witness encounters across like YouTube and um, and you you didn't really see anything on it after that. Just for the audience. So you have a kind of an idea of how you can judge some of these things. So, for example, let's take Bigfoot. If you went on line and you went to YouTube shorts and then you typed in Bigfoot colon or backslash YouTube shorts you will find a gazillion YouTube shorts of Bigfoot. Like some of them are blurry photos. Some of them are real clear photos. Some of them are videos. You have documented evidence of that, right? It's You can try and discredit the evidence or question it, but the phenomenon is real because there's evidence that points to that phenomenon, right? I would mm-hmm. suggest that if you're looking for this cat woman, which is what I'll call her, go look for any evidence and judge it the myth based on the amount of evidence that you can find. Um, not just like drawings and depictions, but actual video evidence. Like we're in a, in a digital age where you should be able to capture some evidence or something. And I, I just haven't seen it. So I, I can't credit it as being real because I haven't seen any evidence of it. I remember looking into it. Um, and I remember calling out for witnesses who encountered it to talk to me about it. And nobody came up with anything. Nobody called me. There were a lot of creepy pastas about it back in the day. And I'm pretty sure you can find a bunch of creepy pastas, which are just very talented writers that, you know, tell stories, but I don't, I don't, I can't say that that's real. I'm sorry. Okay. So then uh, I'm going to kind of combine the final two. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd be interested in both of them is, uh, the rake and slender man um one story about slender man in about six years that was a lie the rake it just depends on how people characterize the rake so for example 
when I was having problems with some of the dog man people, because, you know, the dog man group is kind of they got some fanatics in there mm-hmm. who proclaimed that I was lying. I did a challenge. I started giving coordinates to locations where I know there are dog men. Like I know spots where I can give you, hey, man, this is the Latin long of this spot. Go over there and stay there a couple of days and you might not make it back. Well, I've had witnesses who I call them crazy people who challenged me and they went. And one guy definitely went there thinking he was going to find dog man, but he ended up encountering a seven foot tall, emaciated, pale person um, that would run after him and like ran on two legs and then would bound and leap forward, like his hands touching the ground, his legs coming up running like an animal, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And people said that was a rake. Um, What I believe that was, because in that particular area, this is around the Sabine River um, on the Texas side. There was a lot of a whole lot of occult witchcraft practice there, real occult witchcraft, like real occult witchcraft practice there. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I believe that they did some very, very bad rituals there and they put something there to protect the area. So if you took something like that and you credit that, credited that for being a rake, which we've all seen that photo of what people describe as the rake, is that kind of it's those glowing kind of green eyes and this white mm-hmm. creature. Uh, and it's a photo. I don't know where it came from. That's what people are saying is the rake. Then that's what this guy described. So. Um, and I think we actually discussed this whole story in depth uh, in the first, in the first episode, kind of the, and that's why I combined the idea of, of these a little bit, because I, I feel like there's a lot of crossover in in the descriptions and things like that right and so if that's what you're classifying as a rake then yeah that exists i wouldn't necessarily classify it as a rake um but you could say it's a rake so yeah it exists Would i consider that to be dangerous hell yeah i would consider it to be dangerous but um again i haven't had any encounters where it actually killed the person it, it, it ran the person off you know what I'm saying? We're talking I, from for in order for it to be dangerous, I need you no know, encounter where you and your homeboy was out there and your homeboy got snatched, grabbed, touched, molested, punched, kicked, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, in that case, it just ran him out of the area, scared the hell out of him. But him having a weapon probably helped the situation out a lot. But um, so I would give credit where credit is due and say that it definitely exists. I just I'm just not sure how people are defining a rake at this point in time, because there's been so many kind of descriptions of it. it it's just, it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. All right. So that's, that's my list. Um, well, you know, one thing to add to your list. All right. What, what are, what are some other uh, interesting ones that we've got? And uh, one thing, one thing we talked about is, you know, you've got some, uh, you've got some stories that you have been working on that you have been putting together. And uh, maybe maybe we could start going through uh, some that are on your list. Well, I, there's some things that people need to be aware of more than okay. anything. And I, and I think it's important that they understand that these things exist because what ends up happening is um, in the lexicon of like the paranormal and beings and cryptids, certain entities rise to popularity, right? And so it's like, oh, dog man is real. I can't believe that, you know, and it goes through the process. But there's other stuff that's out there that's freaking terrifying. For example, there are real mermaids out there, like literally real mermaids. Um, I did a story from some gentlemen who are fishermen in Florida where um, they spent the night out on the water fishing. Early in the morning, they're getting their coffee. They're getting ready to get their lines in the water. And this mermaid literally climbs up on the back of the boat while one of the brothers, these are two brothers, has his back turned to it. And it's trying to get one of the brothers. And the other brother ends up shooting it in the chest three times. And then it falls back into the water. And they freak out and get the hell out of there. These two dudes are not liars. They're, they're some good old, you know, hardworking fishermen. And it scared the hell out of them for a while to where they didn't go back out on the water. And then their friends that were associated with them, once they realized that they had this encounter, started sharing even more encounters about mermaids. Then another person who was in the military in the Air Force shared a a mermaid encounter with me where he went out off the coast of Florida. This is around, um, 
Portofino, Florida. I think that's what it's called, Portofino. It's like this real nice resort area. And he went jet skiing. Him and his sons would go jet skiing all the time. He sent his sons back in on a jet ski earlier, uh, early to go get with their mom and start getting dinner prepared. He went back out, ended up flying through the water. You know how you do that turn where you're going fast and you whip it to the right and it kind of digs down into the water, the jet ski, and then it pops up and yeah. you turn and go. Well, he did that and he hit something when he was digging and it pops way up higher than it's supposed to and it flies off from under him. You know how you have the little the latch, like the little, you know, little kitty elastic thing that uh, attaches to your arm. So that disconnects and turns the motor off when you fall off. Well, that happens, but he can't get back to the jet ski because the current is too strong. So he's swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming, trying to get back to the jet ski. He can't get to it. Eventually, it floats away from him. Luckily, he has his life jacket on. And so he ends up floating in the freaking water all uh, all night and like literally damn near having a mental breakdown. And imagine you being in the water. If the sun is going down. You having all these thoughts of, you know, I'm freaking going to die out here. Understand, in a situation like this, your mind plays tricks on you. I've been told by my friends who are Navy SEALs, if you find yourself stranded in the water alone, you have to want to survive no matter what. No matter what your mind tells you, you tell it what you believe. All I can think was I was going to die. My family is sitting there worried. But I kept saying to myself out loud, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. You're not going to die. And that's when things got worse because I would fall asleep and begin dreaming that I was at home in my bed hugging my wife and wake up to the reality that I was floating alone in the middle of the ocean. It was in between one of those dreams where I was going to sleep and waking back up that I first felt a pool in the water. Now I'm panicking because I'm thinking maybe, just maybe, a shark has swum along and bit the back of my life vest. Now, a few minutes later, I feel a tug. And to describe it to you, the easiest way to make you understand this, you, you remember when you were a kid and you played tug of war and there were two people pulling against you or three people pulling against you, how when they all pulled at the same time, your body jerked and moved in one direction? That's exactly what I felt. A tug. This tug was on the back of my life jacket. Understand, remember, I was laying on my back, floating in the water. I feel this tug, and now my body's moving. Understand what I'm going through, because now full panic sets in. And then, boom, my head hits something in the water. Turning around, it's a freaking buoy. Red light on top, flashing. I'm in the water, clinging to the buoy, looking around, trying to see exactly what the hell was going on. So I'm scanning the water. And that's when this head begins to rise from the water. No more. No more than two and a half, three feet away from me. So close that if I lean my face forward, I could kiss it. Its skin is this pale white color. Flat nose with slits in it. Mouth with sharp teeth ears that are pressed into the side of its head and eyes those eyes i will never forget these huge eyes with black pupils this thing reminded me of a fish but as its head protruded out of the water you could see where it had a neck and trap muscles it's right there in front of me for the next 15 seconds we stare each other into the eyes and then it slowly submerges itself back into the water That dude had a horrific encounter, not because it was de- like, you know, it was going to hurt him, but just psychologically that almost broke this man. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Oh, like, yeah. That conversation was one hell of a conversation. Listen to me when I tell you I'm going to try to articulate what I felt in that moment. The emotions were everywhere. I was grateful. I really, really was. I was thankful and grateful, but I was terrified. I mean, absolutely terrified to be alone at night in the water and realize that there's something like that in there with you. What if it decided to come back and eat me? What if it decided to come back and pull me under and drown me? All these thoughts were going through my mind. But nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. It was gone. The sun came up hours later. And luckily, and I say luckily, There was a fishing boat that came by. 
not too far off. So now I'm climbing up the buoy, scratching my arms, my legs, my side, under my armpit, screaming and howling, waving my arms. And these fishermen pick me up and take me back to shore. Once I get back to shore, I'm reunited with my family. My wife was terrified. My kids thought I was dead. My wife explained to me that they sent emergency rescue out looking for me, helicopters, boats. And I tell her, babe, I was out there and I didn't see any of that. I didn't see anyone. I was looking for help. Listen to me, looking back on it all. To this day, I still wonder if I've lost my mind, if I went crazy out there on the water. I try my best to rationalize what I experienced, but there's no way to get around it. I saw this creature. I smelled this creature. I looked it directly in the eyes. There was no magical buoy that popped up right next to me while I was floating in the water. It literally drug me to safety. Off bat, he fit my criteria of like a A level credible witness because he has a military background and um, he didn't have any dishonorable discharges. There was no psychological issues for him. He was pretty high up in the military in the Air Force at that point in time. Um, when he retired. So you met the criteria of being an A-level witness for me because you have the right background. And then to hear that man cry and like have an emotional breakdown, I was like, oh crap, this is definitely real. So we got mermaids for sure. No doubt about it. No way around it. Um, And I definitely put them at a level eight, mainly because I have um, two nefarious malicious encounters and then I have one benevolent encounter. But both of the nefarious encounters were like, oh, it's coming to get you. It ain't like, oh, hi, I'm a mermaid, like on the, you know, on the TV shows or like Sade in the video where she's underwater dancing and looking all pretty. <laughs> no, this is, uh-uh, this thing is ugly and it's about to eat you. So we definitely have mermaids. There's no doubt about that. Okay, so what other creatures do we have on the, uh, the dark waters list of concern? Uh, vampires. And I know it sounds crazy to the <laughs> audience listening. You're like, oh, my man, Dark Waters is bugging. Like, no, he, he done lost his mind. <laughs> hey, I'm going to tell y'all like this. Up until um, this year, and I don't know what the hell has happened in the past 18, 24 months. I, I, no, I, I believe that there's an imbalance in the forces of good and evil all over the planet right now. I'm not even going to go any deeper into that because that's just a whole nother conversation. But what I'll say is this. Prior to the past year, every vampire encounter that I've had people share with me from New Orleans has been on a more of a psychic energy draining level. Like literally like, you know, I encountered this woman um, and next thing you know, I woke up in a hotel room and I just felt drained and tired and worn out. Right. You know, it, it never was. There was no like bite marks, no. Hollywood vampire type stuff. You know, I want to suck your blood. None of that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, out of the blue, when I tell you out of the blue, I start getting people I know down here. Like, not like phone call witnesses from New York. I'm talking about people I can walk up on and be like, yo, dog, let's go smoke a cigar. Sharing stories with me about running into vampires. Um, One guy was at Harris Casino um, and if you look at a map of downtown New Orleans where Harris Casino is, I think they changed it to Caesars Casino now, but you'll see there's the casino and then across the street, if you're at the front entrance, across to the left of the casino is the parking lot. Well, this guy leaves the casino, goes to the little underground thing to go to the parking lot, is headed to his car, and that parking lot has those ramps where you kind of walk up the ramp and then when you get to the top you can go left or right then it loops around and it goes back up again so he's walking up the ramp and sees this guy come out from between two cars and the guy's just standing there and he's like okay this is weird homeboy just standing here like I, i'm not really appreciating none of this what the hell wrong with you <laughs> and so um as he's getting closer and closer he starts to get this feeling like yo this is not right like this ain't this ain't cool like, I'm not about to just walk up on this dude. It's like 1130 at night. And he's like, I'm, I'm not about to do this. Like, I'm, this is New Orleans. You know, New Orleans is notoriously crime written. And it's just like, I'm not, I'm not doing this because oh boy might rob me. Well, no, dude turns around and he's got yellow eyes. He's got teeth like needles, like literally like needles. Imagine hmm. if you had like sharp teeth that interlock, like, 
like needles. If you take a shark, you know how a, a shark's mouth closes and the teeth fit perfectly. Yeah. Bite you would have. Well, that's what homeboy's teeth look like. And he takes off running and homeboy takes off running behind him. Listen to me. I've heard of vampires. Everyone has. But you could have never, ever told me in my lifetime that making a trip to New Orleans will lead to me having an encounter with something that I'm labeling a vampire. Shit, I thought vampires was only stuff made in movies. But no, 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 no. They are real. I'm there in the parking lot at Harris Casino downtown. It's 11 p.m. The lot is not empty, but there's these clusters of cars in there. You know, like three on your right-hand side as you're going up the ramp two on your left hand side in some cases you know one car then you skip about five parking spaces in another car like i said it's 11 p.m i'm walking up one of those ramps when out walks this man normal looking guy black shirt blue jeans he comes from between two cars about 50 feet ahead of me and he just stands there with his back turned to me now i ain't from the quote-unquote hood like people say But that shit didn't seem right. And my car is up the ramp past him. You got to make a right and kind of loop back around. And it's on that side. Listen, like I said, I'm not from the hood, but this shit don't seem right. So I slow down for a few seconds, giving him time, you know, to go about his business. But he doesn't move. He's just standing there. And that's when my instincts kicked in. And I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, hell no, something ain't right. So now I'm standing still looking at him. His back is turned to me. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm not fucking walking past this dude. This is some creepy, weird shit. I'm going to go back the way I came, hit the steps, and go up two floors and then come down to him as opposed to walking past him. As I'm standing there thinking this, that's when he turns around. You know how in those old Buffy the Vampire TV shows, the vampire's face looked all muscular and bony? Well, that's what this dude's face looks like when he turns around. Now pause and listen. I'm 24 years old, ran track my whole life. 100-yard dash AAU champion. Bitch, you not finna catch me. So now I'm running. And he takes off running behind me. But with this stupid, bow-legged, wide-stride run. Never seen no shit like this in my life. And for him to be able to generate any kind of speed running like that didn't make sense to me at all. Now, I'm looking back, I see him picking up his pace, and so I kick it in the second gear. I got four gears as a runner. Like I said, bitch, you not catching me. And remember, we're in one of those parking lots with the ramps. So I'm going back down that ramp. I make a sharp right turn, which means that I'm running back past him as he's coming down the ramp. And that's when I get a good look at this dude, and his eyes are yellow. The entire eye is yellow, and he has these sharp, not like vampire teeth in a movie, more like mini shark's teeth. Scares the life out of me. Now I kick it in third gear, sprint that next flat section of the ramp, turn right and hit that down slope and this dude is still chasing me as i'm going down the next section of ramp a security truck is driving back up a black dude is inside the security vehicle dreadlocks in his hair behind the wheel he looks at me i look at him and i'm like no bitch i am not slowing down i fly past him seeing a door that says stairs hit that doorway proceed to leap down three levels of stairs hit the bottom door and I'm outside on the street. From there, I run across the street to the hotel that parallels Harris Casino's parking lot, the Hyatt, I believe was the name of it, and into the lobby. Now, listen to me, there was no doubt in my mind that I lost that thing on my way to that hotel because I ran across traffic, jumped through bushes, hopped over a short fence, ran through another parking lot, hopped over another fence, around the side of the building, and into the lobby. And finally, finally when I calmed down, I go back outside and take a look in their police cars all over that parking lot. And I need you to remember, my car is still there. The Airbnb that I rented was way on the other side of the French quarters. We're talking about seven, eight miles away. I say, fuck it. I'm not going back in that parking lot under no circumstances. So I catch a lift and head back to the Airbnb. Get this. The next morning. I'm on my cell phone reading NOLA.com trying to figure out what happened, why the police were called to that parking lot. And the only thing, now get this, the only thing in New Orleans news is this small blurb. It says, Harris Casino employee assaulted in parking garage. Police in search of suspect. Listen to me. You understand what I'm saying? 
That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten words to describe what the hell I experienced the night before. Sitting there with phone in hand, I'm pissed because I'm like, you bitches in New Orleans know exactly what's going on in this city. It's some weird, wild, freaky shit here in New Orleans, and y'all be covering it up for real, man. So that's the closest description of a vampire I've ever freaking heard. I mean, ever heard. All right. All right. So let's round this out. What is uh, maybe one, one final creature to round out, round out this uh, trio of creatures that, that uh, our listeners should be aware or concerned about? Yeah, I think. I, but the vampires and the mermaids up there they're nines and tens period i don't, don't care what nobody said that's nine and ten now the other thing that nobody's talked about and i've only had one account of it but it was very very terrifying and it's absolutely true because i've talked to the homeowner and the, the neighbor who encountered this somewhere out there there's a, a creature in and i don't know where it is at this point in time but it's definitely human body like human male hands like a man with hands like yours and mine feet like yours and mine chest like yours and mine but a face that literally looks like a bat like you know how you see the bat's face with their ears and with that nose with the slit in it like this thing is a humanoid a human with a bat face and it was outside of this guy's uh, on this guy's front lawn when he first saw it um, then the next night where he saw it, it was in his neighbor's or side on the side of his neighbor's house, looking in the window. Do you know how in life you have what's called normalcy bias, meaning that you believe that everything around you was just normal? There's nothing crazy that goes on. Well, that's how I was up until this moment. And like I said, up until the moment this happened inside of my house, I've always felt safe. I've never, ever once considered that. There was something weird or strange or even dangerous in my neighborhood. But picture this. It's 2 a.m. when I hear my dogs barking outside. And it wasn't a normal bark like woof, woof, woof. It was that that aggressive, I'm going to eat you alive barking. And so now I'm up moving around the house, looking through the windows. And I see this man in a leather jacket standing outside of my house right there in the front yard. But this man's face is not normal. Now, pause. This is going to sound crazy because I told my family and they didn't believe me either. But he had the face of a bat. And what do I mean by the face of a bat? I mean, his face literally looked like a bat's face. Everything else was normal. Human hands, human arms, human legs. But he had this face of a bat. You know how bats have those long, sharp ears, that kind of pointy nose, those beady eyes. He looked like a freaking bat. He's standing there in my front yard, head up in the air. And it looks like he's sniffing the air. Now, listen, I've told this story many a times. People have not believe me many a times. But I will tell you, he was no more than 15 to 20 feet away from my front window. So I know exactly what I saw. He stands there for about 35, 45 seconds, kind of moving back and forth, sniffing in the air, then just turns around and walks off. I say to myself, of course, it's 2 a.m. in the morning. Maybe you were sleepwalking. Maybe you were just dreaming. But that couldn't have possibly been real. Two days later, I'm coming home from work. I'm already aggravated and pissed off because this chick Cheryl with these big boobs and big ass had eaten my lunch. And when I tried to tell people she ate my lunch and confronted her, everybody took her side. So understand, I ain't had nothing to eat all day. I've been sitting in traffic. I come home late. It's about 730. The sun has already gone down. I'm sitting in the driveway, getting my briefcase, getting my keys out of the car, grabbing my cell phone. And when I look through the rearview mirror, I see a guy walking by the back of my car along the sidewalk with a leather jacket and jeans on that looked exactly like the guy I saw two days ago standing in my front yard that looked like a bat. So now I'm hopping out of the car, taking a look, and this guy looks at me and he looks normal. I mean, completely normal. And he says, hey, how you doing this evening? So now I know the jacket because it was the same jacket. And I say to myself, all right, cool. You were dreaming. You freaking tripping. It's all good. Head into the house. Grab me a sandwich. Give me some water. And now I'm trying to get to bed because I'm just over the entire day. 
Now, I'll never forget that Friday night, not only because of what I saw, but because it was a terrible week. Me going back and forth with people in the office trying to defend Cheryl, even though this big booty, big titty chick was a thief. She had been stealing all kind of people's paperwork, stealing their lunches. She was just a despicable person. So every day I came home aggravated and the more aggravated I came home, the harder it was for me to sleep. So I was looking forward to getting some rest on this Friday night. I'm in the bed laying down and I cannot go to sleep. It's 10, 15 p.m. I get up to get a glass of water, head into the kitchen, and I just so happen to look out of the kitchen window. And I see him, the bat-looking dude with the same leather jacket and jeans on, standing in my neighbor's yard. The only difference this time, for whatever reason, my dogs were not barking at him. He's in the neighbor's yard, peeking through a window. Now, this time, I know for sure I'm not tripping because I'm wide awake. So I circled to the living room, grabbed my cell phone, called my neighbor Ted. And understand, Ted and I didn't have the best relationship, and that's due to what I call the War of the Roses, because his wife one day got mad because she got out of the car and one of my rose bushes pricked her, so she came out and started cutting my bushes. A whole bunch of confusion involved with that, but nonetheless, I called Ted. I said, Ted, listen, there's a guy outside in your side yard looking through one of the windows. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to go out the back door, come around your side yard and confront him from that angle. I'm going to go through your front gate and confront him from that angle. And we're going to find out what the hell he wants. And if he don't do the right thing, Ted, we're going to whoop the shit out of him. Understand, at this point in time, I only got on a tank top and some drawers. Slide on my tennis shoes, head to the garage, grab a golf club. And now I'm out of the front door, tiptoeing over to Ted's house and getting in position by the gate. Now, sure enough, as things would have it, I open that gate going in with the golf club and Ted's ass has not even come out of the house yet. So now, imagine me standing there, golf club raised up over my head saying, Ha! Ah, what are you doing here? It turns and looks at me and sure enough, it's got the body of a man in the face like a freaking bat. And when I say it's looking at me, it's looking at me like it doesn't register me as a threat at all. Listen, that's the read I'm getting off this creature and I'm thinking, should I just swing at it? When Ted comes around the corner, flashlight in hand, hauling ass, and tries to tackle it. But get this, it's too strong. Only thing it does is shrug his shoulders, and Ted goes flying off, slamming into the house. It turns, takes two leaping steps, gets to the backside of Ted's house, makes a right turn, and then disappears. So now, picture the scene. Me, still standing there with the golf club in my hand. Ted, dizzy, laying on the ground, back up against the wall of his own house. I extend my hand to help him up and say, man, did you see what he looked like? And it was only then in that moment that I realized he never got a good look at him. Because Ted says, nah, I didn't see what it looked like. But the son of a bitch was strong, man. Did you see what he did me? What do you think he wants? Why do you think he was here? Now, in that moment, I had a decision to make. Was I going to tell Ted exactly what he looked like? Or was I going to let the whole situation go? Honestly, I didn't want my neighbor thinking I was fucking crazy. So I just tell him, man, he was pretty big and scary, man. Hopefully, he won't come back now that we confronted him. Listen, now we're sitting in Ted's garage. His wife wants to call the police. And I'm telling him, look, I don't think this guy's going to come back because I don't want to give the police a description of what I saw because they're going to lock me up in a crazy house. So I said, Ted, look, what we need to do is we need to get some cameras and some more lights and put them out here. That way we can guarantee that nobody comes back and looks at our house. And that's what I did. I put up more floodlights and cameras. He did the same thing. And since we've had those cameras up, we haven't seen anything. But one thing I can tell you, if it comes back, we gonna get it on camera. Now, what we gonna do with the evidence? I don't know. But it can't get anywhere near these two houses without being recorded. I had never heard of anything like that. And I spent about five hours between the two of those people just to make sure they weren't lying. Cause I was like, I ain't never heard of nothing like that. And they are, when I tell you they went from having regular floodlights on their house to having floodlights, cameras, ring doorbells, like who has a ring doorbell on the back door of their house? You know what I'm saying? Like nobody does that. That's how scared these people are. Like it, it's terrifying. And so that would be the other creature uh, it didn't really do anything aggressive. It was looking. It didn't try and hurt him, except for when they assaulted it, it got out of the way. I can't tell you what it is. Um, I had people contact me when I put that story out and said they've experienced something similar. Um, 
but they didn't want to go into details of their stories. Like, yeah, I, I can verify that that's true. And I was like, okay, well, won't you tell me what happened to you? But it was two people. They didn't want to go into the stories because they said the stories were too frightening and they didn't want to go through the PTSD of reliving it. And I've been working on them, but they still haven't shared it. So to me, that's absolutely terrifying, but it didn't really do anything. It, I guess it was just being nosy or maybe it saw something it liked through the window. Um, and then it went on about his business. So I would give it a five, but those are some of the things you need to be aware of that are actually out there that nobody's talking about. Like they talk about dog, man, they talk about Bigfoot. And then we talk about dog, man, you know, dog, man is an alpha predator. You that's 12 on the, on the scale of do not mess with, leave that thing alone. Like just go on. If you see a dog, man, just go on about your business. That don't make no sense. You don't want none of that smoke. That is definitely real. It's documented. We've got videos. We've got photos. That's on my YouTube channel. Um, so there's no doubt about does that exist. Like, hand down, that's real. And you need to leave that the hell alone. I don't care what anybody tells you. There are people out there who say, oh, you know, I want to get with my friends and we want to go hunt dog, man. That's the dumbest thing on the planet. That's the stupidest suggestion. If your friend told you that, your friend doesn't love you and your friend doesn't like you. Period. <laughs> that's all I can say. Awesome. Well, James, thank you so much for for taking the time to share these stories. Is there uh, or do you have any other uh, final final words of warning or or anything you want to share with the listeners? Yeah, I, I do have words of warning. I want people to be mindful of the times that we're living in. I alluded to it earlier when I said I think there's an imbalance in between good and evil. It's clear that there's a lot of spiritual warfare going on. It's clear that there's an uptick in demonic activity and strange and weird things. Um, all the way down to people having strange and weird emotional behaviors and feelings. And if you're out about around people a lot, you'll notice it. People seem like they're losing it, like, like really going crazy. You can see it in how people drive. You can see it in people's eyes. If you walk by somebody on a bus stop, that is sitting at a bus stop, you just see things aren't right. And you need to act accordingly. You know what I'm saying? Now is not the time to be, I'm going to be a paranormal investigator and I'm going to go look into, you know, this phenomenon. Now, now is the time to sit your behind at home and like chill because it's too much weird <laughs> stuff going on. It really, really is. And when there's an imbalance between good and evil and the scale starts to tip in one direction, then um, certain things are released into our world that haven't been in our world before. And I think that's what's happening. I think we have seen a tip in the scale it's trying to balance itself back off. I don't know if it's going to be able to balance off, but you are seeing it manifest in these weird and crazy experiences from, for example, one lady who called me and, and um, she was finding crows in her apartment in her daughter's bedroom. The crows were literally flying down the chimney and going into her daughter's bedroom and sitting on a dresser in her daughter's bedroom. Like that kind of stuff just don't happen. Something's going on. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be mindful of that. And I would tell people, be prayerful over your families and over your friends, um, just to make sure that you give yourself some kind of hedge of protection because it's, it's weird stuff going on, man. It really, really is. And like, like I told you at the beginning of the interview, I said, man, if we're going to really get into demonic stuff, we need to pray. Because it's it's just crazy, which I'm glad we didn't get into that because I don't want to deal with that right now. Yeah, I, I don't need that. It's only... It's only Tuesday, man. I don't, I don't need that. I don't need that stuff this early in the week. Right. Uh, I don't need that stuff at all, let alone this early in the week. But well, I appreciate you taking the time again to hop on. If folks want to, you know, follow along with the stories and what you're doing online, where can they find you? Uh, you can look up Dark Waters on YouTube, and then if you want the catalog of all my stories, uh, go to imdarkwaters.com. And become a member and you will find everything. There's a lot of stuff there, a whole lot. And you can submerge yourself for months in the content that's there. Awesome. Well, I will make sure to link to all of that on the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com. James, man, it's always a blast sitting down and talking, uh, talking with you. I'm really excited to get this one released. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you again soon, buddy. Ladies and gentlemen. That'll do it for this episode of The Wild Initiative. A big thank you to Dark Waters for taking the time out of his day to warn us and educate us about all of these creatures. Make sure to head over to his website at imdarkwaters.com. Give him a follow. 
And also check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com and get links to all the eerie little things we talked about in today's episode. That'll do it for this week. I'm looking forward to next time. But until then, I hope this episode inspired you to get involved. Get what? No! Thank you for listening to the Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more. 